Look, if we want to build morale around here, let me build a hydroponic garden. I got two words for you, Jim. Yeah. Heirloom tomatoes. This review is brought to you by Audible. Hello everyone, Lost Planet 3. Now Lost Planet is part of that select class of game franchises that began during this console generation and it's seen no fewer than three installments. It's nowhere near as well regarded as Uncharted and Gears of War, but it does have its following, including a very active Lost Planet 2 multiplayer community. Now, Lost Planet 3, the pendulum is swinging back to the more exploratory designs of the first game, but now it's through the lens of a Western studio, Spark Unlimited. Lost Planet 3 is presented as an origin story of the settling of Eden 3, which provides Spark the opportunity to present the planet in its most hostile form not to mention offer context for all the ruined settlements in the first game. Protagonist Jim Payton is part of a group of colonists looking to make the planet suitable for humanity, although his first few orders do little to further the effort as he's preoccupied with maintenance work. Much like the early stages of open world urban crime games, taking orders and going on errands can be engrossing, giving proper context and when it doesn't feel like actual work. The problems Jim faces is a seemingly endless to-do list of fixing broken equipment in industrial structures. Now, for a planet that supposedly is in the early stages of human colonization, the man-made structures should have fallen into disrepair rather quickly. And just when these assignments feel just as fun as working on an oil rig, the game subjects you to an actual drilling mission. This would feel like a cruel twist, but at least this goal of protecting the rig from the indigenous acrid turns out to be one of the game's more well-executed sections. The story and objectives eventually become more than a tiresome series of space janitor assignments, but getting there takes about four to five hours of grinding it out. There are certainly minor twists and revelations concerning the history of the colony, but you're left wondering if suffering through the game's initial triviality is worth it. Furthermore, one of Lost Planet 3's biggest defenses is offering side missions that are merely banal replays of earlier story missions. Braddock, can you hear me? I found some abandoned Nevik base. Seems like it's been here a long time. Which is pretty funny since you've been telling us we're the first humans to set foot here. If there's anything of value to this working class perspective of interstellar terraforming, it's that Spark embraces every level of it, starting with Jim's awkward one-way video messages to his wife. This creates an intimacy not found in the previous two games. Sorry to bother you while you're at work, but it wouldn't kill you to take the trash out every once in a while. There are also minor narrative touches that make Lost Planet 3 a more grounded experience. Discussions about hazard pay and updates from accounts payable echoed the scenes in Ridley Scott's Alien when Parker in Dallas harped about full shares. 15% of your contract payments will be paid out to you in the form of tea energy, since that has become the normal currency around the base. Having said that, the contrived nature of the international ensemble cast of supporting characters is tiresome, but at least the arrogant French machine operator is counterbalanced with a friendly Canadian quartermaster. You make an honest dollar, you come spend it here, eh? Jim's transport and protection from the planet's environment is an imposing bipedal mech that's simply named the Rig. Much like some of the weapons in Dead Space, the Rig's appeal is how it's a tool being utilized beyond its intended design. For all its capabilities and story-triggered upgrades, the Rig is a couple modifications short of being a fully functioning battle mech. Fisticuffs against bosses are trying exercises and triggering button prompts, but there are encounters where you can take the initiative with a straight punch. It's just a matter of figuring out when you're allowed to do it. To Spark Unlimited's credit, it is an impressive convenience to jump in and out of the rig nearly instantly, provided the outside weather isn't too hostile. It's unfortunate that there weren't more opportunities to capitalize on this during combat, as there's striking versatility in attacking from either the rig or on foot. The machine even has an umbilical cord that grants Jim enhanced healing giving the player motivation to stay near the rig during combat. The rig is a more durable mech than the vital suits of the previous game, which does open new strategic possibilities not found in the prior game. The catch is that your areas are limited to places where the rig can fit. Since much of the game's levels are smaller, more enclosed spaces, your reliance on the rig is limited. 
and you're often left playing a generic third-person shooter. The level design features an adequate assortment of natural and man-made structures of various shapes, often laden with cover points and sprinklings of verticality. Some indoor spaces are confining to a fault, leaving you to suffer camera limitations and multiple retries since you have to share room with numerous acreage. If you played the other Lost Planets, you know the drill. Acrid come from nests and you're condemned to an endless stream of giant bugs until you find those nests. If this ground combat provides any stimulation, it's that you're constantly faced with value judgments on addressing the nests. Do you charge into the gauntlet towards the nest for an efficient grenade takedown, or do you play conservatively and slowly take out each acrid between you and the nest? If you pride yourself on your grenade throwing skills, the game does offer chances to toss those explosives into mouths of nests or acrid, which can feel very gratifying upon success. There is an underdeveloped feeling about the combat. Jim's steady aim yields a lot of successes in ranged attacks, while this single animation melee attack feels lacking against lesser acrid. Not having a stomp move is all the more puzzling when you can stomp opponents in the multiplayer. While it is empowering to manhandle an acrid using the rig's claw, taking down most of the bosses on the ground reveals an all too lazy game flow that we've seen in many unremarkable encounters countless times before. It's the old story of dodging attacks and taking advantage of an opening while the enemy is stuck or incapacitated. The glowing orange weak points especially draw comparisons to Dead Space 3. This high degree of familiarity coupled with the tiresome missions leading to each boss makes defeating them feel like a hollow accomplishment. You don't feel like celebrating a kill, you're just happy to get it over with. Between the rig and his adequate weapons arsenal, Jim is well sorted for the hazards of Eden 3. His key piece of equipment is a grappling hook that he uses to traverse vertically along cliff faces and horizontally on zip lines. One would think that this gadget opens a new possibility in combat tactics, but very few of the areas are thought out well enough to make you consider the grappling hook as a reliant aid in shootouts. The grapple hook assisted mobility underscores Sparks' terrain-heavy vision of Eden 3. It's a slightly skewed take on the original game, blue in tone rather than white. It's effective in conveying solitude, but again, it's too bad your travels are hampered by menial industrial tasks. One would think that this monotony will be broken up by the countless battles against the acrid, but the limited variety of enemy types, let alone the occasional presence of acrid swarms, only compounds the repetitive aspects of the game, leading to frequent sensations of boredom. For as much as the campaign achieves and falls short, the multiplayer fares slightly better. Team Deathmatch is actually the least addicting of the modes, which is saying something when every map invites you to play around with grapple hook mobility. Having such a tool can be an asset in escaping overwhelming hostiles, or it can be a detriment by sending you into harm's way. Where the multiplayer excels is in its multi-phase matches, and there are quite a few of them. One starts off as a short Horde-inspired format, which later shifts into a King of the Hill match. There's a grab bag appeal to the multifaceted scenario mode. Plant bombs in one phase, capture an outpost the next. The one glaring imbalance are in matches involving one team escorting a bulldozer, while the other team attempts to prevent the bulldozer from tearing through their base. The duration of the match, plus the durability of the bulldozer, greatly favor the team on offense, reducing the appeal for anyone playing defense. Just as much as the multiplayer benefits from gameplay accomplishments of the story mode, it also stumbles in kind. It's frustrating trying to get a button prompt to appear in order to grab an energy capsule, especially when you have a swarm of opponents converging on you. Moreover, the multiplayer's playlist of six maps just barely satisfies the need for variety. The character progression works off a pick-as-you-go customization system designed around a spherical grid consisting mostly of weapon upgrades where, curiously enough, your rank only increases with each item purchase. Like most multiplayer modes, repeat players reap the rewards of more useful items like an auto turret. Starting out might be tough against the big boys, but grind through it for the first couple of hours and you'll get access to just as many useful items. Even as an outsourced project, Lost Planet 3 easily complements the sheer hostile world of Eden 3 from the original Lost Planet. That said, it barely manages more than other prior extreme condition games, like the forgettable extermination and cold fear. With every significant feature Lost Planet 3 pulls off, such as the rig, there is something equally disappointing, like the monotony of the maintenance-oriented missions. Spark Unlimited pulls off the rarest kind of Western project based on a Japanese franchise. 
a profoundly average effort that is neither noteworthy nor a complete disaster. A two out of five. So there you have it, Lost Planet 3. Not terribly encouraging. If you feel the need, please comment below. If you would like to see a review of a game we really, really liked, go check out Rayman Legends. It's kind of a bundle of joy with only a handful of snow levels, if any at all. So, if you like our reviews and you would like to see more of them, well, please check out Audible. They have over 100,000 audiobooks and spoken word entertainment in every genre to be downloaded to your phone or MP3 player and play back anywhere, anytime. This week, I'm recommending a true story about a less than successful attempt to survive against the element. John Kruckhauer's Into the Wild. You can go to audiopodcast.com slash web3games to get a free audiobook download when you sign up today. You'll get to listen to some smart words that'll help your head and you'll be supporting Web3 Games.